before I sit down and turn my back to you, um, what we're going to do now is have not quite a Greek chorus, but a little bit of a sounding board reality check, because we've got three people here who've had huge experience and still have huge experience in uh, development in the development industry, if I can use that word, um, two still acting as ambassadors and one who is now closer to the policy world but has also been a practitioner. So what they're going to be doing is looking at some of the stuff that's been said so far through their lens. And I also will be coming to a couple of people in the front row um, to get some of their stories that are re related and also ask you all to take part. So this will start out with a bit of a three-way interview and then develop into a sort of controlled free-for-all, I hope, controlled. Okay, Karen, if I could start with you. So, so well, the, let me say that I'm, I'm really impressed by what we have heard, and I think this kind of independent research is extremely important for donors to listen to because donors have a tendency sometimes to formulate both the question and the answer because they know a lot. Uh, but by putting uh, the, the role of formulating the questions and maybe not providing the answers but evidence, and I think this is extremely important. So, uh, this is uh, one major message to donors. And, and uh, the second one on donor, uh, and I'm talking now as an old hand at CEDA. I was working for CEDA for 30 years before joining the Nordic Africa Institute, uh, is that it's not one donor. There are very many donors in one country. So at the country level, it's not just about what one donor can do, it's about what can donors do together with the government and with private sector, with civil society. There are so many actors and we have to realize this, not to forget academia, because academia is also extremely important and the cooperation between academia, I have come to, to realize is maybe, it, it, it provides this evidence-based uh, uh, information which we need. And I think also working together, in my case then, with researchers in Africa is extremely important. Working with the bank, working with other research institutes in Africa helps us to formulate the right questions and hopefully inform also donors. But donors must take time to inform themselves. Okay, I just want to put you on the hot seat as opposed to just the speaking seat for a moment because you mentioned the fact that there are so many actors and let's just focus now on jobs. And you, folk, you mentioned that donors often ask the questions but provide their own answers and that there are so many of them. And um, God, years ago, I was working on something with the whole Paris, getting everybody mm. on the same page, which still is not quite a reality. So how much can you use results like we're hearing today to actually get donors um, to kind of work, if not always in tandem, but at least going in the same direction? Well, uh, first of all, by sharing the information uh, between themselves, but also by sharing information with the donor government, uh, I mean the recipient governments. I think this is extremely important, not to sit here, but to be there and to discuss and be informed by the research, and as I said, to share it. Okay. I think this is extremely important. Morton, you're there. I mean, you're here now, <laughs> but you're, you're usually in Bolivia. Yeah, no, I, I agree very much with uh, Karen, and I also think we should uh, get on the same page. Uh, maybe we should get on the John page. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> You've been practicing that, uh, John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's terrible to have a name for the funny. No, I... I, I <laughs> I think that we, I, we should uh, definitely understand where we are. Uh, we should definitely uh, have very, very close dialogue with the partners. Uh, we should also realize that, that uh, at times, uh, what is also important is that the governments that we're working with uh, also have access to, to knowledge. Uh, sometimes ideology also plays in. Uh, we also know economists uh, often do not really agree on everything. Uh, what we're trying to work on, of course, and what, uh, with, with, what the, the research also is trying to do, of course, is to try and find, find the evidence, which is, is the facts, and come up with, you know, well-documented uh, recommendations. 
but uh, we work, uh, we should work with many different uh, uh, partners. We work with government, we should also work with the private sector, we should also work with the civil society. Um, and I think we, we try to do that, but we should you know, know where we are. Yeah, but coming back to that vote, uh, the percentage of the people in this room who actually think that aid should go through the private sector was quite a bit smaller than those who think you should work through governments or NGOs. What's, no, because you've, in discussions we've had, you've pointed out that often, you know, that is a, a, a relationship that's difficult to build because there's distrust on all sides. And it, it's kind of key to actually get it moving forward in the right way. How do you do that? Well, I mean, if we take uh, Bolivia, we, we had uh, Evo Morales coming into government with the social movements, basically a whole new set of people uh, compared to the old elite, to the old formal sector. And always uh, there's a great deal of uh, lack of confidence in the old uh, elite. Uh, the old elite is much better educated. It also means that you are bringing in people into government with uh, a lot less education, a lot less experience, a lot less exposure to, to also research and, and, and the world as such. So in such a, a, a situation, of course, you, you have to, uh, you have to uh, try and dialogue. I mean, you have to just try and engage, even though at times uh, you, you don't really find that what, is, uh, uh, what, what the policy they're making, you, you, think it, it, you might think it's wrong. But even so, I think it's important for us to, to engage. Is it, does it actually work better? Because Eve was talking a little earlier about the, I mean, this is a very small scale, I know, but the Bolivian knitwear uh, co cooperative, I, I'm not sure what we'd call it. But where you can actually show, because you can understand why there's some skepticism towards the private sector and the old model amongst those who are now in government in Bolivia. They've been excluded for so long. But is one way to actually get them more on board to show them projects which actually function? Well, I think it, in, in Bolivia, the, it's, it was very difficult to work on, the, on sort of the business environment to get the confidence with the old formal sector. So the investment level is very low and the private invest, investment level is very low in Bolivia. What you register in the formal sector, it's less than 10% of GDP in a situation where you have growth rates of 4 to 6%. So it's extremely low, the, the investment rate. But probably the government's focus is more on the informal economy. So I'm sure if you did some research on the informal economy, that's sort of the, the sense you get when you walk around, is that the informal economy is really growing. So you have the whole ocean, which you're not measuring, that might be growing, and where people are getting, getting better off. We see it, uh, Bolivia, in contrast to Africa, you have seen a, a significant fall in, in, in the poverty rate. Uh, extreme poverty have fallen you know, within a very few, few a little time period five, ten years, maybe ten percent uh, percentage points. Uh, so I think so. Th that's an indication that the government is focusing on the informal economy, even though it's anti-neoliberal, it's actually focusing on the economy which is informal, which is, I guess, completely neoliberal because there's no government regulation. So it's, it's also, so, so I invite you all to come to Bolivia and study this, these paradoxes. Okay, and I think we'll get into it. We've got definitely some, some comments coming later on on this, but Johnny, not just through Tanzanian eyes, but also Mozambique, because you've spent a lot of time in Africa. What's your take so far on the day? Well, first of all, I think this is uh, extremely useful and uh, I'd like to say thank you. I mean, this, this, is, this is very good. When we put employment and youth on top of our Africa strategy in 2006, it was to engage people like this uh, to try to focus on these issues. And I think it's been a, um, I mean, a little bit slow in coming, but now it's coming and it's giving on us guidance and these kinds of discussions are extremely useful. I had a chance to work very closely with, uh, with Dees and with, with Finn Tarby in Mozambique to give me almost daily guidance. And it is necessary to have this kind of knowledge when we uh, take uh, tough decisions, sometimes decisions that uh, means a lot to a lot of people's lives. So on, on that one, yes. Okay. Then how to apply it and what we do um, is, is, is maybe a more difficult one. Okay, I, I'm, I don't stop because I, what you're going to need to do is give us good warning of which picture you want to see when you want to see pictures, just warning you. So sorry to interrupt you full flow, but go ahead. More difficult to decide what to do. Yeah, well, first of all, I think that's one thing that isn't difficult and show some nurses. Okay, can um, we see the nurse's <laughs> picture, please? <laughs> there, is, there is still a very large part of the jobs that aid is going to finance that will be in the public sector. 
And okay, I don't see the nurse's picture coming up. There they are. You can take the box of us out of there. Okay, so the nurses, why are they important? Because there is no way that you can tax finance what this costs from a $500 per capita country. When you need at least $60 for health per capita and at least $60 for education per capita, and you are at 500 then you can tax your population 25% and pay for these two things only, and then there'll be nothing left. So we will still have to do something in that. Of course, we need to have private sector coming on to bring up on growth and things. But for some times, these jobs are very important. Okay. And there are comparisons to the Scandinavian model. I was lucky enough to get from the structural change work that Justin Lee is doing. Sam Jones helped me get some of the figures. So what is Tanzania in terms of income level in Denmark? It's the early 1800s. We had no tax finance social sector in Denmark. We had a guy called Grundvi starting to run around and think about educating our people. So financing this from taxes is very, very difficult from this income level. So there is this part of the job that still have to be there. So okay. not forgetting there's a long way to the Millennium Development Goal, especially for some countries. Then I'd like to see maybe some beekeepers. Okay, can I see the beekeeper picture, please? And I think we, there's a graph yeah. next to it. <laughs> we have yes, there we go. No, the yeah. yeah, these people are beekeepers and they, uh, they know I'm from a long family of, of beekeepers in Denmark, so they let me taste their honey. It's very good. The, the point here is that th this, this is the kind of can job we, where people... Can we see the next picture? So being well, an ambassador is not all hard work. <laughs> <laughs> you can also eat honey. <laughs> but I mean, th these people are there and they are in the poor jobs, so to say. So they, they, they have a forest. And actually, the, the Danita project in the beginning was just to ask them not to chop it all down to charcoal and all that. So how to invest in, in uh, some other income-generating activities. And they have been hugely successful in, in, in uh, 13 forest areas in, in Tanzania uh, in producing honey. So you have 40 people producing 250 liters of honey with very little input, like $100,000 for 13 forests. Now they produce 250 liters of honey, and it's $10 per liter, just down the corner. They, they, that's a huge impact on their daily lives, and you can employ much more people in that. That's productivity increase in f traditional family agriculture. Okay, we'll get to the other bits a little later. I want to come back to Karen, because the informal economy has been mentioned a number of times. Mm. And Karen, one of the things that you had pointed out to me is that too often governments actually do not support the informal economy. They actually hassle them. Can you um, yeah. elaborate on that a little well, bit? Well, yeah, I think, I mean, when we are talking about, let, let's start with the private sector. We think about private sector as if it were wage employment. You go to an office, you do this, you do that, you go home in the evening. But private sector, the major or the larger private sector, at least in Africa, is agriculture and the informal sector. You are your own uh, entrepreneur, so to say. We have heard that. And the issue is also, as we heard, to get them maybe sometimes out of jobs, but also to increase productivity. And I think the example Johnny was given here by the, the honey is a very good example of agriculture. And I'm referring to, uh, there are many reports on Africa this year focusing on employment. Uh, the Development Bank, Africa Development Bank has one. Another one was published by the uh, Economic Commission for Africa together with the African Union in Addis. And they are also putting, maybe not in the same, but the same issues is on their agenda as John here said, but they put agriculture on top. Maybe uh, the first one you put there was more a means. How do, you, how do you manage your natural resource income? But agriculture is extremely important to increase productivity, not just for employment purposes, but also for food security and environmental uh, purposes. I mean, we know that Africa will be hardly hit by, by uh, climate change. So, and Africa is already uh, starting to move into areas which uh, are very, very vulnerable from an agricultural point of view. But we also know that there is a demographic factor. Africa's population will double in 40 years. They need food. 
So uh, this is about the informal sector. The informal sector is producing things for the consumers, and those who are employed, they can also consume. So I think we have to look at these two factors, uh, uh, you know, in a more co coexistence between consumer and producer. And the informal sector has so far been the major sort of binding uh, links between these. But I, productivity needs to increase, so we need to invest and create better conditions, not hassle those who are street vendors. One day, I mean, take a woman, for example, she's producing tomatoes, she's an agriculture in that sense, then the next day she goes selling her tomatoes in the street, but in many cases she's being, ha you know, chased away from the street because police doesn't want to see this kind of people in the street, particularly when you have World Cup in football or any other things going on, uh, then they you know, send them out of the city. Okay, if, if I could just go back to Gary Fields for a moment, because Gary, you have a, another story we didn't tell earlier of um, Ma Masabisi, Ma I'm sorry if I mispronounced, yeah. Um, <laughs> now she was actually trying to make a living selling stuff on the street and got stopped. So what was her story? Her story, so Masabisi uh, was a handicraft vendor in uh, Durban, South Africa. She rented a uh, an Oceanside stall from somebody that had a permit to do that. And the police came one day and asked for her, uh, her identification card, which she produced, and the license, which she produced, but they weren't in the same name, so they said, you have to leave but within 24 hours or we're going to conf confiscate everything you have. Uh, and so I was at a policy briefing not too long later, and uh, the officials that were responsible for these things were there. They, uh, they said they were trying to protect people like us, they said, pointing to the Westerners in the audience, against people like them, pointing to the Africans in the audience. And I just couldn't take that. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, these people are trying to earn a livelihood. And how are they going to earn a livelihood if you don't allow them to sell, to sell things? And it, it's, it's precisely from looking at this problem as poor people are trying to earn a livelihood. They need to do some kind of work. And what is the point of trying to stop them from doing this kind of thing? I think your story is right on. OK. Um, th this doesn't actually come into uh, w one of the issues. Because later on, we've got, we've got um, some people in the front row from the labor movement here and the Federation of Small and, and Medium-Sized Danish um, Enterprises, and they've got just some interesting stories to tell and, and also eye-openers If for those of you who think that labor and business don't get along. Um, but I'll come to you guys later. First of all, Morton, I mean, how does this play into what you're seeing, not just in Bolivia, because your experience in Africa is pretty huge, too. Well, I'd like to say something else. Yeah, I'm sorry. okay, you may. <laughs> Uh, just uh, in in, uh, in 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 Bolivia, you find the the productivity in agriculture very low. It's actually yeah. half of what you see in the neighboring countries. So obviously, there you have uh, you know an opportunity. Uh, we're working with uh, with the Minister of Agriculture to try and uh, design interventions that will help the small scale farmers, like the beekeepers, like the quinoa uh, farmers in Bolivia, who are living in the Altiplano in, and are the the poorest of the the, the poor in the countryside, very harsh conditions. They only have their yama and they have their quinoa. Of course, the, the quinoa is, 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 is very uh, healthy. Everybody wants to buy it, so the demand has gone up, the prices have gone up. Uh, so we've been, together with the Ministry of uh, Agriculture, trying to uh, work with the actors on the ground uh, in, the, in the farming areas, getting their associations together, uh, uh, helping them getting the certificate to uh, export organically, uh, helping them uh, uh, looking into the problem of, 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 of uh, credit so that which would allow them to store their crops for a few months so that they could take advantage of a higher price. Um, so I think the, it, this, 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 this type of infant intervention takes time. Often uh, you find the, the, the beekeeper women, you know, you help them solve one problem together with the ministry to, to where you also involve the, the local uh, 
uh, knowledge which exists in the area, there will always be somebody who knows something about beekeeping who would be able to, to who will be willing to say sell some of the services. But this often is a process which takes a long time. You don't just give the money for one-time investment because you need to have the access to the knowledge, you need to have the access to the market, you need to have the access to the finance. Uh, you need to know uh, what are the requirements of the market, you need to transport it. So there are a lot of things that a, a, a small-scale business uh, needs to take care of before you can actually succeed. And maybe you need to have this type of assistance, uh, not just one time, not just two years, maybe for, for a number of years before you sort of get on a plateau where you can take off and, and your business is, let's say, sustainable. Okay, um, Johnny, one minute, but before, I want to just take a step back for a moment, and Ebe, uh, because so much of the economy around the, in the developing world is informal, how difficult was it, um, both for donor countries, but also in your negotiations with recipient countries, to actually focus on projects which work with the, develop, with, with the informal sector? Was, was there a, a barrier? that had to be overcome in order to actually say, look, we have to be able to help these people because by helping them, they will become part of the formal sector. I'm just curious if that was a, a hurdle. Well, there was originally a barrier in actually getting agreement on working with the private sector as such, uh, both the informal and, and the formal sector, from governments who clearly saw some money disappearing that they otherwise would have uh, had into the government coffers. So, so it's very important. It was a very, it was a very important discussion. Um, I think we, in most cases, managed to, uh, to convince. Also because, <coughs> and that's also what com what's coming out of the World Development Report, that you need to address things at different levels. So we had a good dialogue with uh, most of the governments we worked with, saying we would also like to help you uh, in creating the what we call the enabling environment, creating the conditions that you actually can create, uh, so so uh, so the private sector can create uh, jobs. You also need to focus on. We have this discussion of the informal and the formal, and I agree that you shouldn't just you know say that it, uh, it, it uh, that we should f f uh, focus on on, on the formal uh, in the first one. I think we should focus on what kind of incentives could you put into place for small uh, self-employed to actually, so to speak, uh, integrate into the formal sector, thereby also providing uh, the tax base for the government and so on in the longer run. So there are a lot of issues there, and, and some of these you can address by vocational training, you can address by legislation. In Tanzania, we worked uh, in establishing a, a commercial court, so you can also attract investments in, in that respect. Can I just make another comment? When <laughs> Actually, yeah, I think the, the question before was wrong. You, you cannot say it's either government or private sector or civil society. It's, of course, all of them. All and of then, the above. And then I would like to also... Uh, uh, to hey, the you panel know, I'm a journalist originally. Yeah. It's got to be black or white. Give me a break. I'm, f <laughs> I'm full of respect for journalists, absolutely. <laughs> um, retired, actually. Long retired journalist. Even better, even better. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I think there's one uh, element uh, missing here. Uh, I can think when I heard Karen uh, said uh, for donors to do so and so and so. Uh, one of the first questions we had uh, on the screens, uh, I think there was a huge majority pointing to governance issues yeah. as uh, some of the main challenges uh, you have to address. And that's, I think, we need to get our partner governments into the picture here as well. This is not just a question of what donors can agree to or not. Yeah. This is, you know, we. We would like to align with local uh, uh, priorities and and, and 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 take it from there. So I think that's uh, that's uh, an angle we need to have into the discussion as well. And we are happy to share all the findings from this program with all our partners all over the world, uh, in order for all governments to actually use it uh, as basis for their policy decisions. Okay. Coming back down, because Johnny um, Eb had mentioned what was going on in Tanzania, and I know I stopped you off in mid-flow from production, but can you pick up again or continue on as you wish? I'd like to show a picture of two cornfields. Could we have the cornfield pictures, please? <laughs> um, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I think this is uh, pretty much what... Uh, we have heard about agricultural productivity. There's no climatic reason or anything else for these two fields to be looking uh, so much apart. 
So basically, the climate's the same in both places. Now, can you guess which one is in Denmark? <laughs> <laughs> so 800 kilo of maize per hectare is not going to create rural wealth. And again, if we compare to Denmark, I know you can't do that all the time, but there are two very interesting features happening. And I also say this to provoke a little bit of comment from, uh, from the unions here. When we started to create rural wealth in Denmark, shortly after we settled our issues with Napoleon and all of this, <laughs> yeah, then we're, we're getting we, context we here, started <laughs> to really build rural wealth. And by increasing, in, increased productivity, and people got money to spend. By then, they started to build things themselves. So the monopoly of the union city-based guilds, laone, was broken because there was money in the rural areas and all of a sudden you had 40% of people actually doing this kind of work, living in the rural areas. So there was a sort of a demand-driven breakdown of some structures in the labor market that had existed for very long. When I go around Tanzania, I suddenly, in a very poor village, I see a sign which said Guanam Lango. So it means Mr. Door. So this is the carpenter. Now some people have money to ask somebody to build them a door. They are creating enough wealth to want a door. The problem is, which is different from Denmark, and one of the questions I have to, uh, I mean, this whole issue of, trans, um, of putting people in other uh, sectors where productivity is higher, is that this guy in Tanzania will very soon face very stiff challenge from an aluminum door imported from China just down the market. So he'll no longer be building this wooden door that sort of help us uh, sort of create new kind of jobs. When we were shedding the low productivity agriculture jobs into higher productivity manufacturing, we didn't have Chinese stores of very thin alloy competing with our sort of craftsmen and our production. So That's it, one it, question. Okay, but is the argument that you should basically, um, first of all, think not just of moving people out of agriculture sideways, more or less, into manufacturing, but that you should, first of all, give them the chance to make the f fields transform from one to the other so that they can actually earn money on the farm? and or is it that you just, when they do go, you have to be a little more careful of how the transformation takes place? I mean, well, who do you want to ask your question to? And it'd have to be one to start, all right? Okay. We can't have Ga the whole Gary. panel. Gary. But I want to add another one. <laughs> but one question at a time. All right. Gary. I think you raised a very important point, which is in talking about productivity. Product what What's the definition of productivity to be used in this context? And if you think about productivity per employed, output per employed labor hour, uh, that's not the right metric to be using when there are so many labor hours that want to be more fully employed. Uh, that looking at how much output you get per hectare of land to take your last photograph is much more meaningful. I think it would also raise a question about what would be an appropriate policy for allowing in aluminum doors from China. Uh, and this is a question about what is best in terms of reducing poverty of the people of Tanzania. And once one starts asking those questions, one gets very different answers from than one gets by using standard metrics. Okay. Gary, just one memory of all of us. I know that there's a certain amount of talking back and forth, but let us not forget that we have people out there, so we want to include them, even though I'm turning my back to them, <laughs> but that's because I have to interview folks here, but just when we can to remember. So, does it, your second question, Johnny. Yeah, it, re it relates a bit to how we finance these things, because we also wanted to help uh, people move into other areas, and we heard today that microcredit and finance uh, could be one of, of, of the solutions. Now, we are very terrified still in, in, in government, Danita, to distort the market. And that's why this whole uh, discussion uh, arose about 15% and who's, who's then to get 15%. I've shoveled out money to fishers in, 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 in Tanzania, cheap loans. It ended up everybody being a fisher, especially people who moved out from the army. So it's very difficult to compartmentalize these things. So you cannot create uh, these uh, sort of segments and who then 
do you want to subsidize? But the NIDA actually predated all this uh, by investing in a bank in the 90s. We have a picture of the bank, please. <laughs> so, Surprise? Um, the, and that's sort of the, then I'll stop, uh, the anecdotal. When I was a very, very young man, I started working as an economist for the NIDA. And one of the first things somebody told me to do is buy 100 Land Rovers, buy 100 Avery weighing scales, and buy 100 Thompson safes. So I said, what are we going to do with this? Just send it to Tanzania and we'll tell you. So I did this and I went to Tanzania. We took the Avery weighing scales and bolted them to the floors of the Land Rover. We gave them an Avery weighing scale, which is one of these old fashioned weighing scales that uh, you use with the lead. And a guy with a shotgun, and then we drove into the villages with loads of Tanzania shillings, because the peasants had stopped weighing off their produce to this bank, because first of all, they used Russian or Chinese weights where you couldn't really see what was happening, so they thought they were cheated. And the checks that bank wrote were absolutely useless, so they wanted cash shillingi. So that's why we needed to, to go with, with safes and, and shotguns. It <laughs> went completely broke, and we helped restructure. Somebody in the need, not me, but other clever people, they invested uh, $8 million in this bank in, uh, in the mid-90s to help restructure it. And I now have a daunting task of selling a 30% share post, which is at least $80 million worth, and it's 1,500 jobs just in the bank. So not what the bank did for other people, but just jobs created in the bank itself. So that's another point of risk willing capital. Maybe my uh, predecessors were very risk willing or stupid, I don't know what, but they did something very good for Tanzania. And this is the second largest bank of Tanzania today. Thank you very much. Uh, where do I go from this? <laughs> I wanted actually to, um, to talk a little bit about, or to get you all to talk a little bit more about the uh, informal economy and the cooperation of uh, international organizations with that. And, and, and I think what I'm just going to briefly do, because w w you had mentioned in your first notes the problems that people have in the informal economy. And obviously, it's a huge issue, and we can't forget how many people are actually employed there. So what I was really interested in is um, Darian Reber from, from Danita, who's been a great help to me, but put me in touch with um, Jorgen Assens, who's with the Danish labor movement. And Jorgen then put me in touch with Jens Kvorning, who is with the Danish Federation of Small and Medium-Sized Businesses. And I was quite surprised to find that they actually are working together um, to well, both help formalize and do some work. I'll let them tell, tell the story briefly, of course. And I'll start with you, um, Jorgen, and then yep. if you could pass it on to, to Jens. I'll try. <coughs> it should be on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me start just with a brief story. Uh, from it, it'll be a brief story. <laughs> Sorry. From West Africa, from Sierra Leone, where I just came back, and they have just decided in the Labour Congress in Sierra Leone that they would accept to get members from the so-called informal economy. They made that decision and changed their constitution earlier this year. And as of today, yesterday actually, they now have 400,000 affiliated members from the informal economy. And they experience that people are joining the union because of uh, basically uh, they believe that the union can help them protect their rights, avoid harassment, as you say, uh, but also help them to achieve some social security. And thirdly, also to create some more decent employment, decent jobs for them. Uh, and to that end, uh, we have tied, uh, they have tied in with uh, the Danish labor unions and also <coughs> with the Danish Federation of Small and Medium Scale and whatever employers, yeah, uh, employers, where Jens is representing, to try to get us to help them to initiate some training programs, some uh, business development programs, which would help them to, for some of their members, 
who want to become em say, real employers or entrepreneurs to develop their skills in the way so they can also generate new and more decent employment. So that's the whole, and we have been granted some funds from Danita and so on, so uh, lucky for that. Okay, if you could pass over to Jens. I mean, Jens, you were quite excited about the kind of cooperation that is going on at an artisanal level and then further up and the skills that are being learned. And we're going to hear more from um, Kay and Tetsushi this afternoon about this, this, this need. But, you know, I was, to be honest, quite surprised, even though this is Denmark, um, to find that labor and employers were working together. And sorry, I miss... miss named your, your federation. So how did, it, how did it start working with you? Well, we uh, started having a long experience with the formal sector via the Danita program, uh, business to business program, where we mainly assisted uh, uh, companies in developing countries uh, by training them with Danish companies in similar businesses. And uh, that, from my opinion, has worked very well over 20 years. And, um, but still, we, especially in Africa, it didn't work as well as in Asia and in uh, Latin America. Uh, so what we, and one of the reasons for that was that it was a, a very small population of companies you had in the formal sector in Africa. So we saw a need for developing uh, informal enterprises uh, because if you didn't add new companies to the formal sector, you would not be able to make this kind of programs. So, um, and then we were in close contact with the uh, Ulen uh, which is uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, union's uh, uh, corporation organization here. And uh, they had uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, idea of uh, bringing company, no, uh, some of the unemployed uh, into work by- Ah, if, if the training programs. Yes. By I'm establishing their own companies yeah. in the informal sector. Yeah. So this has been a way to break the wall because we couldn't really manage to get into the informal sector. But th thanks to uh, the unions who had access to these people who needed jobs in the informal sector, we could certainly uh, move. And uh, what we're actually doing is to uh, teach people to work smart rather than hard. Not that they don't continue to work hard, but at least they can get a better outcome from working hard. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. No, you can, well, it, it literally is 30 no, it's, seconds. It's just one thing is to say, I think the experience here we have is to, uh, we would like uh, social partners, we are representing them, to get much more involved. And we're actually a little puzzled once in a while that there's not, not many more efforts to involve the labor market uh, yeah, partners into job creation. Well, let's hope that this is, um, in a way, we're doing a little matchmaking, and we'll end up with some new partnerships. Now, the three of you, I'm going to throw this open to the floor, but I'm sure there were things that you wanted to say which I haven't given you a chance. So I'm going to briefly say, Karen, was there something else that you wanted to throw in before we start taking questions from everybody? Well, uh, yeah, I think it's, it, it is important also to discuss, I mean, the, the obstacles uh, which exist today. And, uh, uh, and I think one major obstacle for small uh, enterprises, for the informal sector and for manufacturing at large and including agriculture is the lack of infrastructural investments. And I think that uh, I remember 20 years ago, when I worked with Tanzania, uh, the Swedish IKEA, which may be known to you, <laughs> uh, tried to buy uh, goods from Tanzania, cotton towels, uh, but also pine things. I don't exactly remember what it was, but it, it stopped because of lack of energy. Energy was so irregular, so the producers could not deliver according to the plan, which IK is very, very <laughs> strict on. <laughs> strict on. Yeah. So I think that that's another issue where donors also could come in, yeah. and the World Bank in particular. Morton. Well, I, th I think the issue of, uh, of, uh, of transformation, uh, structural transformation of economies, uh, where you 
let's say an agricultural country like Tanzania or Bolivia, where productivity is very low, you need to raise it, but you also at the same time need to create uh, decent jobs in other, other areas. You have a big informal economy where a lot of people work uh, as street vendors and, and, and salesmen uh, trying to make a living. living. That's where the people are. But you somehow, so, so I mean, what type of, uh, what type of uh, uh, intervention, what type of policies can you design? One, to identify you know, whether you should invest more in getting the informal economy, the street vendors or the bee, bee producers, try and improve their uh, productivity and get them into the, into the marketplace, and to what extent uh, you should uh, focus more on the more formal economy, where you'll find uh, in, 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 Ghana, or in, in Bolivia you have the, the mining, modern mining sector, where productivity is uh, 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 100 times more than uh, uh, you find in, 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 in the informal economy, but the jobs are very low. Yeah. But you, you need to, to focus this, this transformation, I think, how to identify the intervention policies. Just to, yeah, to come back to that, because you mentioned the, the, the mining industry and the extractive industries, and it seems that as an outsider, one sees it all too often when there is a mining or extractive industry or some sort of natural resource. Um, not only the natural resources, but a lot of the profits seem to go offshore. And we always focus on the governance in the countries where the stuff is being mined. We rarely focus on the governance of the actual companies that are coming in. But you know, how do you then convince governments that the profits from these things really need to be reinvested? And it's been mentioned already today, and John, you focused on it as well, that you start to build kind of the skills so that you can reinvest and start those alternative modes of growth. No, I think Bolivia is a country that depends very much on it for its exports and for its GDP also on, on gas and on minerals. More than 80% of its export is gas and minerals. About half of the GDP are in these two sectors, but they only provide uh, between two and three percent of all the jobs. So obviously, how you spend the the, 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 the revenues? Fortunately, so far uh, in in Bolivia, at least, a lot of this has been going into the social sector investment, but also in, in infrastructural investment. So uh, distribution, which are, and distributional uh, 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 transfer, income transfers uh, to, to 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 elderly to uh, to school children and so on. And there are plans, of course, also, as in most of these countries, to also set up some kind of a, a sovereign fund which can you know, ensure a better use of, of, of the resources. Yeah. Johnny. Yeah, I like the discussion about the investment in infrastructure and, and natural resources. Uh, when, uh, I mean, these nurses that we just saw before, they were very successful. I mean, they kept all the children alive from the 80s. This is why Africa now has a huge challenge with youth and employment. In Europe, we always made sure that there was enough war and disease around to not get this problem. But now Africa has it. And it's going to be very, very difficult to create that many jobs. But one of the prerequisites, I think, is if, if the farmers can grow enough and raise productivity on the land, it will still be a huge challenge to get it somewhere to where people can buy it. So the post-harvest losses and the prices and all these things are an enormous problem. And one of the reasons is that there is such a poor infrastructure in Africa, which is partly due to no investment for 20 years, but also partly due to the fact that it has not been... Uh, I mean, some of the donors who used to finance this have been pulling out of that sector, and we, including Danita, but also World Bank and others, and I think there's a very good case for investing the kind of seed money that donors can provide and then challenge the government or, and encourage them to put some of the money from the infrastructure, or from, from, the, from the natural resources into infrastructure so we can actually get this produce moving around in Africa and to export and raise farm gate prices. Okay, well, you, you bring me up this whole concept of infrastructure and investment. Henrik Garver. You've got a story here to tell about working on a highway, and also it created jobs. But the, if you could focus a little bit on the highway and the need for it, and then the jobs, and then we will move on again to the audience. Right, but I think, I think there are a lot of uh, important issues here. The, the case that I bring along is from one of our, my member firms, uh, Covey Consultants, who, who worked on the majority of, par uh, of the parts of the Tansam uh, highway linking uh, Lusaka to Dar es Salaam. Uh, 
and I think there are more key issues, really, if you look at it. First of all, you get this infrastructure investment, which, as uh, John focused on, uh, creates who, who paid a regional... For it? Who paid for it? In partly paid through, through foreign aid. Um, so, so that's very good investment in infrastructure. And what we see is that, in part, you get international consultants bringing in international knowledge, but they build up local companies, uh, local professional service firms. They also actually, so they have a local subsidiary uh, there. They also use additional local companies, surveyors, water experts, and so on. I mean, basically, through some of these infrastructure investments, you get a local uh, professional service economy, which is this structural change that, that John is looking for, and actually also uh, that creates a better economy. If we look at the actual road, uh, we have a road which is designed so that the street vendors can actually sell things along the road without blocking traffic. We get more, uh, less uh, traffic accidents and so on. So we get a lot of benefits in addition to creating a stronger formal economy for the private sector. And this pri these private sector firms then works for other private companies and not just for development aid agencies and so on. So Plus better trade between Zambia and Tanzania, Tanzania because exactly. John was mentioning that issue and I know a baby it's dear to his heart that you actually get those connections working. So, so really the point is infrastructure works. If so win-win-win. Thank you very much.